United States. Washington, D.C. January 13th, 1982. 12.30 p.m. Joe Stiley, an executive with a large telecommunications company, arrives at Washington National Airport with his secretary, Nikki Felch. Joe and Nikki are on a business trip to Tampa, Florida. They're scheduled to depart at 2.15 p.m. on board Air Florida Flight 90. Flying is a big part of Joe's life. He's a former Navy pilot, and his job involves regular trips around the world. In those days, I was probably getting on a 737 and flying somewhere once to twice a week. It was almost a routine thing for me to be doing what I was doing that day. Outside, the weather is anything but routine. Washington, D.C. is experiencing one of the worst winters in decades. Temperatures drop to minus four degrees Celsius as a snowstorm rages. Nikki was definitely looking forward to getting where it was warm. She said, I brought my swimming suit, did you? <laughs> and I, I had not remembered to even pack one. Washington National Airport is just five kilometers south of Capitol Hill on the banks of the Potomac River. It's a major hub for flights from across the USA and Canada. On a normal day, more than 400 aircraft land here. But today, the airport is struggling to stay open in the heavy snow. 1.38 p.m. All flights are grounded while snow plows clear the runways. The operation is expected to take an hour. At gate 12, Air Florida Flight 90, a Boeing 737, is held up by the delay. It seems like every year it gets worse and worse. Yeah, I know. I can deal with rain, but the snow is... Captain Larry Wheaton is 34. He's a family man with two children. Roger Pettit, his first officer, is just 31. He's a former US Air Force fighter pilot with an excellent record. But both men have less than three years' experience flying 737s. At 2 p.m., Flight 90 begins boarding, 20 minutes late. On the two-hour flight to Tampa, the aircraft will be just over half full. There are 71 adult passengers and three young children. Many are helped aboard by 22-year-old flight attendant Kelly Duncan. For her, the job is a dream come true. I loved my life as a, as a flight attendant. Whenever I went anywhere in my uniform, people would always comment about it, and it was something that I was very proud of doing and something that I really enjoyed doing. Near Joe and Nikki are Priscilla Torado, her two-month-old son Jason, and her husband Jose. They're relocating to Florida, where Jose has found a job in the construction industry. 2.20 p.m. Captain Wheaton expects the airport to reopen soon. He orders the ground crew to de-ice the 737. Okay, guys, you can get started. It's a routine procedure to remove snow and ice from the aircraft before takeoff. But a string of further delays keeps Flight 90 at gate 12 for another hour. Clearing the runways takes longer than expected. And then, there's a backlog of flights. There's nothing anyone on board can do but wait. Outside, the snowstorm continues. I could see snow accumulating on the aircraft and all around the aircraft. But it snowed the entire time we were there. When clearance to leave gate 12 is given, there's another delay. Ice on the tarmac 
makes it difficult to move the 737. We're too heavy for this ice. Captain Wheaton decides to help out with a blast of reverse thrust from his engines. Hey guys, I'm gonna put a little reverse on it. Are you sure? No, don't worry, it'll be okay. Three thirty-five p.m. Flight ninety eventually begins taxiing to the runway one hour and twenty minutes behind schedule. It's a relief for flight attendant Kelly Duncan. When we were finally moving away from the jetway, it was wonderful because I felt like we are finally on our way. Wheaton and Pettit go through their after-start checklist. Is the ice? Ah, oh. APU running. Flight 90 then falls in behind other aircraft queuing for takeoff. Two window exits at the center of the cabin and two doors at the front. Oh, this is bad. Probably the worst snow I've ever seen. Seatbelts are released to show. Both pilots can see snow on their wings. Pettit is concerned. You know, it's been a while since we've been de-iced. 3.59 p.m. Flight 90 is cleared for takeoff. Position and hold. Flight attendants, please take your seats. At the rear of the passenger cabin, Kelly Duncan straps herself in. Joe Stiley, Nikki Felch, and Priscilla Torado are just a few meters away. 3.59 p.m. and 45 seconds. Torado. The 737 finally begins to roll down the runway. Seconds later, thrust readings jump past the target level for takeoff. Now, look at that. That doesn't look right, does it? Pettit responds by easing the throttles a touch. Yes, it is. There's 80. But now, oh, it's taking longer than usual to reach takeoff speed of 144 knots. That's not right. And there are strange readings on the flight deck. 120. Joe Stiley is worried. We were nowhere near the normal speeds that I was used to feeling every week in a 737. Going down that runway was like riding in a backcountry road full of potholes. Flight 90 eventually hits takeoff speed. Easy. And leaves the ground. Me too. Suddenly, the nose pitches up sharply, and the aircraft starts to shake. In the cockpit, alarms warn the pilots that Flight 90 Forward. is about to stall. Forward. They have seconds to act or the 46-ton aircraft and the 79 people on board will fall out of the sky. Flight 90's high nose position is creating so much drag that the aircraft is losing speed fast. Easy, all we need is 500. If the 737 slows down too much, it will stall and then simply drop. Captain Wheaton orders First Officer Pettit to lower the nose by pushing the control column forward. Forward, forward. But he can't drop the nose too far, or the plane will stop climbing. Come on, barely climb! As the shaking intensifies, former pilot Joe Stiley fears the worst. I remember vividly saying, how the hell do I get out of this airplane now? And knowing that it was too late, I was already kissing my rear end goodbye. 12 seconds after liftoff, Flight 90 has traveled one kilometer. 500 meters ahead, the heavy snow has created a traffic jam on the 14th Street Bridge over the Potomac River. Construction worker Marion Grant Jr. is on the northbound span. His truck has hardly moved for 15 minutes. Traffic wasn't moving at all. Like we'll sit still maybe three minutes and we go five feet and five feet. 4 p.m. and 53 seconds. At an altitude of just 352 feet, Flight 90 suddenly stops climbing and begins to drop. Captain Wheaton jams the throttles forward for maximum thrust. But it's too late. Commuters on the 14th Street Bridge hear the scream of jet engines. We're 
Joe Stiley is knocked out as Flight 90's fuselage breaks into four sections. I remember the sensation of blacking out, and I remember saying to myself, God help me. Flight 90's wing has flipped Marion's truck over like a toy, but he stumbles out, alive. The carnage on the bridge is horrific. I saw a guy crushed to death, you know, and then I saw another guy, seemed like his head was decapitated and stuff like that. Joe Stiley regains consciousness. His bones are broken in 67 places, but now he has just seconds to cheat death again. The water was just rising into my nose and coming up fairly quickly. It seemed like forever to get my legs loose because the seats had collapsed. And then I reached over to try to help Nikki get free. And as I get to the rear of this airplane, I know that I'm free because I can suddenly see just a glimmer of light in the water. And then I knew I was free of the aircraft and started up. Stunned witnesses gather on the bridge. A news cameraman takes this footage just minutes later. The entire 737 bar the tail section has disappeared. Joe and Nikki have made it to this island of wreckage along with four other survivors. One is the young mother, Priscilla Tarado. Another is flight attendant Kelly Duncan. She's bewildered. I have no recollection of the impact. One minute sitting in a warm jump seat, the next minute in freezing cold water. The water is just one degree above freezing. The human body can only survive in these conditions for about 30 minutes. It hurts to be that cold. It feels like knives in you to be that cold. The emergency services arrive minutes later, but their inflatable boats can't get through the ice. It's a devastating blow for Kelly. I really felt like I was kind of just losing hope, thinking, this is really going to be the way I'm going to die. I just didn't feel like I was ready to die. The survivors have escaped a plane crash. But now, they'll freeze to death, unless rescuers reach them within minutes. 4.06 p.m. The U.S. Park Police helicopter unit in Anacostia Park, two and a half kilometers from the crash site. Park Police Aviation, Officer Gailey. It's a tower. They're reporting a missing aircraft, 14th Street Bridge. Pilot Don Usher is a combat-hardened Vietnam veteran. He springs into action with paramedic Gene Windsor. They know visibility is appalling. And Eagle One, their Bell Jet Ranger helicopter, isn't designed for heavy rescue work. But they're determined to help. We did what we were supposed to do, what we were trained to do, and what the public expected us to do. Four ten p.m. 28-year-old Lenny Skutnik arrives at the crash scene. Lenny spotted the commotion while driving home from his office job in the center of Washington. He's unnerved by what he finds. When we got down on the riverbank, it was um, kind of an eerie feeling. It was snowing, and you know, that, that quiet when it snows, and someone screaming for help out in the, the river. Made your hair stand up in the back of your head. Eagle One is almost flying blind. 
Don is forced to scan the ground for roads which he knows lead to the 14th Street Bridge. The only visibility we possessed was looking through the chin bubble, what would be called slant visibility. Gene ties together makeshift lifelines. 4.22 p.m. The six survivors have been in the freezing water for 21 minutes. Their limbs are numb. They can no longer move their hands. They're giving up hope. And then they hear Eagle One approaching. I suddenly felt the whomp, whomp of a helicopter. Then the Park Police helicopter came into view. The relief I felt at that point uh, <laughs> is unimaginable. I have never heard such a beautiful thing as the day that I heard that helicopter. Don spots the survivors clinging to the tail section of Flight 90. We realized as soon as we looked at them that every second counted between life and death to get them out of that river. The first survivor Eagle One rescues is 41-year-old Bert Hamilton. Gene then throws one of his improvised lifelines to flight attendant Kelly Duncan. I just remember looking up into the sky and just seeing a rope hanging down from it. And I just pulled it around my back and uh, they pulled me out. Don and Gene now try to speed up the rescue by dropping two ropes. Joe Stiley grabs one of them and wraps an arm around Priscilla Tarado, the young mother. Nikki Felch, Joe's secretary, grabs the other rope. But to Joe's horror, she's too badly injured to hold on. It was the worst feeling because if there's any one person I'm going to try to help first, it would be Nikki, and I, and I can't. Seconds later, Joe loses hold of Priscilla. I didn't realize it at the time, but all the fingers in my left hand were already broken, and my arm was broken. Eagle One drags Joe to safety. The crew know Nikki will be kept afloat by her life jacket. Priscilla is their immediate priority. After 30 minutes in the freezing water, her chances of survival are on a knife edge. Lenny Skutnik is horrified as he watches from the shoreline. She was close enough where you could see the expression on her face. And her eyes just looked wild, and she looked like she was going into shock then. Time and again, Priscilla slips from the life ring. Traumatized, exhausted, and temporarily blinded by aviation fuel, she begins to drown. Lenny realizes he can watch no more. It was just too much to take. I absolutely thought she was going to die if I didn't go in and get her. He jumps into the freezing water and drags Priscilla to safety. I believe it's a human instinct. I didn't weigh it or think about it, I just did it. Eagle One now returns to Nikki. But she's too weak to grab the life ring. The crew respond with their most audacious rescue so far. G steps onto the skid, grabs Nikki, and wrestles her to safety. Four thirty five PM. The rescue is over. The sixth person clinging to the wreckage, whose hand is seen here, has disappeared. He's later identified as Arland Williams, a forty six year old bank examiner. 
74 passengers and crew on board the 737 are dead, including Priscilla Torado's baby son and husband. Four more people die on the bridge, bringing the death toll to 78. Five people survive the tragedy, but only just. I had a skull fracture. My nose was broken, my cheeks were broken, my jaw was broken. All my fingers and thumb on my left hand were broken. My right leg was fractured. My left leg was shattered. Both feet were broken. Other than that, I was fine. Oh, and I had a hypothermia. News of the disaster is broadcast around the world. Some of the victims died on impact, most drowned in the icy waters of the Potomac River. There's one question on everyone's lips. How did a routine flight turn into one of the USA's most horrific air disasters? Now, by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal the chain of events that led to the crash of Air Florida Flight 90. At the time of the disaster, Bill Hendricks was the National Transportation Safety Board's Chief of Air Accident Investigation. He's a former US Navy pilot with more than 20 years experience as an air crash investigator. January 13th, 1982. News of the disaster reaches Hendricks just after 4 p.m. Hi, Bill Hendricks. It's one of the most important calls of his career. I know there'd be a, a lot of pressure on this investigation. It's uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, a lot of congressional interest, a lot of media interest. It's, it's the capital of the United States. I'll get back to you. Right Hendricks rushes to his second in command, Rudy Kapustin, who will run the investigation on a day-to-day -day basis. They immediately call the GO team, a squad of NTSB experts on 24-hour standby to deal with a major air crash. The investigators reach the 14th Street Bridge later that evening. The crushed cars tell them Flight 90 came down steeply. It hit onto the uh, four or five vehicles and, uh, and flattened them out like a pancake up down to, their, down to their rims before it plunged into the water. This is all they know for sure. The question is, what triggered the disaster? There are many possibilities, from catastrophic mechanical failure to pilot error, even sabotage. But the snowstorm is the most obvious suspect. It was just a gut feeling that somehow this weather had something to do with it. But Hendricks knows this cannot be the whole story. Dozens of other aircraft took off from the same airport on the same day without a hitch. Whatever happened to Flight 90 must have been unique. It's a mystery, and solving it is going to be tough. The wreckage of Flight 90 and the clues it might contain are at the bottom of a frozen river. And both pilots are dead, so what happened in the cockpit will remain unknown unless divers find the black box flight recorders. First thing we always look for are the recorders. From the flight data recorder, get altitude, heading, airspeed. From the cockpit voice recorder, get the last 30 minutes of conversation in that cockpit between the crew. Early the next morning, US Coast Guard vessels break through the ice and reach the wreckage. They join forces with the Army and Navy to launch a massive salvage operation spearheaded by a team of 82 divers. Hendricks and his team set up headquarters for the investigation in a conference room at the nearby Marriott Hotel. While the divers concentrate on recovering bodies, the investigators begin interviewing more than 200 witnesses. As an investigator, uh, we're trained never to guess that uh, hunches are good, but you gotta back them up with facts. The team begins by questioning the ground crew who de-iced Flight 90 at Washington National Airport. 
any faults in their work could have left snow and ice clinging to the aircraft with grave consequences. The lift an aircraft needs to fly is created by a smooth flow of air over the wings. A layer of ice or frozen snow creates a disruption which can reduce lift and increase drag dramatically. Experts call the problem contamination. The ground crew insist Flight 90 was fully de-iced before it taxied to the runway. But the investigators probe deeper and uncover an intriguing fact. The operator who de-iced the right side of the aircraft mistakenly thought the air temperature was minus two degrees Celsius. In reality, it was minus four. As a result, he sprayed less than the recommended amount of de-icing agent onto this side of the aircraft. The investigators feel on the verge of a breakthrough. They decide to examine the de-icing process in even more detail. We're looking at the entire de-icing process. What was the uh, mixture of the de-icing fluids? How was it dispensed? They test the de-icing solution used on Flight 90 and uncover something even more disturbing. The fluid contains half as much of the de-icing agent, glycol, than expected. So the de-icing spray was somehow weaker than the operator's control panel indicated. How could this happen? The team examine every component of the de-icing vehicle used on Flight 90 and find their answer. A specially calibrated valve in the glycol delivery hose had been replaced with an unmodified valve. The result? A reduced flow of glycol to the nozzle. So it wasn't just the right side of the 737 which didn't get enough glycol. It was the whole aircraft. It was not a very thorough de-icing job that was done on that airplane. It was not that good. It was uh, marginal at best. But the investigators know this is far from conclusive proof that Flight 90 was contaminated with snow and ice when it took off. Ground crew used the same de-icing unit on other aircraft without incident. So although substandard, it may still have done an adequate job. If Hendrix's hunch is to hold up, he needs better evidence. What his team discover next shocks them all. Okay, guys, I'm gonna put a little reverse on this. Captain Wheaton used reverse thrust during pushback from gate 12. Thrust reverses are normally used as a braking system when an aircraft lands. Are you sure? They should never be used before takeoff in wintry conditions for one simple reason. The reverses redirect the jet of hot air leaving the back of the engines towards the front of the aircraft. This can shoot a cloud of slush onto the wing and into the engine inlets. In sub-zero temperatures, the slush can refreeze within minutes. The use of reverse thrust is further evidence snow or ice could have caused the disaster. It was very poor pilot judgment to do it. Uh, not a good idea. Then Hendrix gets another break. A member of his team tracks down an extraordinary photograph. It's a snapshot of Flight 90 taken by a passenger in another plane at approximately 3.20 p.m., just 10 minutes after de-icing finished. The image is grainy, but it shows fresh snow is already on the aircraft. The photograph is further evidence that the 737 may have been contaminated after it was de-iced, regardless of how well the job was done. By day four of the investigation, most of the bodies have been recovered. The focus of the salvage operation can now move to the wreckage. The parts are taken to a hangar at Washington National Airport for detailed examination, but they yield no clues. 
and the two crucial black box flight recorders are still missing. Finding them is a daunting task. Divers are equipped with an acoustic homing device. But the tangled wreckage is spread over an area of dark, freezing water the size of a football pitch. The media is hungry for answers. But NTSB spokesman Francis McAdams still can't announce any breakthroughs. As I told you before, I have no idea until we get all of the evidence. The investigators turn to the one card they haven't yet played, the survivors. Survivors are, are in the airplane. They hear sounds, they feel bumps and grinds and, and hear noises. They supply a, an awful lot of information. Joe Stiley describes how Flight 90 shook violently before it crashed. His words confirm the investigators' suspicions. They know this could be the result of ice and snow disrupting airflow over the wings. But then, Joe reveals that the 737 seemed slow and sluggish during its takeoff run. Why could this be? Other aircraft didn't have this problem, despite the snowy conditions. Hendricks and his team are mystified. Then, seven days after the crash, a diver picks up a faint signal. He follows it through the icy water until he can just make out a tangled mass of wreckage. He carefully pulls away twisted pieces of razor-sharp metal and hits the jackpot. In his torch beam, he spots one of the flight data recorders, then the other. It's the moment everyone involved in the investigation has been praying for. After the recovery, Secrest lifted one recorder over his head in victory. A big moment for the salvage team after a week of frustration. They've got the scene now. All right! When the word reaches the team that the recorders are, have been found and are being recovered, that is a very good piece of information. The investigators rush the black boxes to their labs. After days of speculation, they're about to find out exactly what happened in the seconds leading up to the crash. They're excited, but they also know they're about to listen to the voices of the dead. Boy, this is bad. Probably the worst snow I've ever seen. You know, it's been a while since we've been de-iced. The team are stunned when they realize both pilots can see snow on their wings, yet they don't turn back for more de-icing. I mean, this one's got about a quarter to a half an inch of snow on it all the way down. I got a little on mine. I was uh, amazed, perplexed, uh, wonderment, if you will, that under the regulations, the federal air regulations, you're not allowed to take off with uh, snow or ice or frost adhering to your wings. Could this be why Flight 90's nose shot up just seconds after takeoff? As the investigators know, the Boeing 737 tends to pitch up sharply if the wings are contaminated with ice or snow. But just when the evidence seems to be mounting, they realize something just doesn't add up. They're perplexed by First Officer Pettit's comments about his instrument readings. Oh my God, look at that. That doesn't look right, does it? To try and find out what was worrying him, they study the flight data recorder. Immediately, another mystery rears its head. They discover that survivor Joe Stiley was right. The 737 took 45 seconds to reach takeoff speed, 15 seconds longer than normal. If the aircraft was contaminated by ice and snow, this might slow takeoff slightly, but not for an entire 15 seconds. The team realized something else was wrong with the 737, and they don't know what it is. They could be back to square one.
they can think of only one thing which would slow a 737's takeoff dramatically. Insufficient thrust from the engines. But why would a crew take off without powering up properly? It seems an absurd idea. The riddle can't be solved by examining the engines. They are still at the bottom of the Potomac River. And Flight 90 was fitted with a pre-digital flight recorder which didn't monitor thrust levels. There's only one option left. The investigators scrutinize the low-level engine sounds picked up by the cockpit voice recorder. Using a technique called sound spectrum analysis, they translate these sound frequencies into thrust readings. Yeah, it's 1.7. That's too low. The results are a shock. Both engines were running at a thrust level, or EPR, of 1.7. But the 737's takeoff EPR should be 2.04. The team are baffled. It looks as if the pilots took off without sufficient power. My God, look at that. That don't look right, does it? But how could this happen? Oh, start pressure. Up. The investigators play the cockpit recording again and again, looking for clues. The board is not then they pick up on a tiny detail. Pitot heat, on. Anti-ice, off. APU, running. Can we hear that again? Shoulder harness. The investigators are dumbfounded. He said off. Shoulder the recording is poor, but Captain Wheaton seems to say off when asked about the engine anti-ice system. Anti-ice? Off. Hendricks realizes one small word could unlock the mystery behind the disaster. He knows thrust readings for each engine are produced by two sensors, one in the inlet and one in the outlet. Together, they produce thrust readings by measuring the ratio between air pressure at the front and the back of the engine. But if the engine anti-ice system is off, snow and slush could freeze up the inlet sensors. On some other 737s, this has caused the sensors to send pilots faulty thrust readings, readings higher than the actual thrust produced by the engines. If this happened to Flight 90, the crew could unwittingly have taken off with insufficient thrust. This could be the final piece of the jigsaw. But Hendricks needs to prove it. He asks Boeing to carry out tests, confirming the effect of inlet sensors blocked by ice or snow. The results are dramatic. The engine quickly creates an EPR reading of 2.04. But in reality, it's running at an EPR of 1.7, exactly the same weaker thrust level revealed by the sound spectrum analysis of Flight 90's engines. This could explain First Officer Pettit's confusion. No, that's not right. Maybe it is. His EPR dial says 2.04, yeah. but his throttle position and his readings for exhaust heat and fuel flow reflect the lower EPR of 1.7. No. But how could the pilots make the appalling error of forgetting to turn on their engine anti-ice system? And why didn't they abort takeoff when they realized something was wrong? Once the roll started with these observations by the first officer, that takeoff should have been rejected. The investigators study the pilot's records and discover that neither had much flying experience in winter conditions. But they also reveal something even more disturbing. Over the last two years, Captain Wheaton has had to retake two routine proficiency tests after receiving poor scores. His weak areas included adherence to regulations, checklist usage, and knowledge of aircraft systems. The revelation adds weight to the theory that pilot error 
played a key role in the disaster. But there are still two major pieces of evidence missing. Flight 90's engines. Without examining them, the team can't prove beyond doubt that the anti-ice system was off or that the crash wasn't caused by an engine failure. Then, salvage squads lift the battered engines from the river. 13 days after the disaster, they're rushed to manufacturers Pratt and Whitney for examination. Technicians strip the engines down and painstakingly search for any sign of a mechanical problem. But they find nothing. Then they inspect the anti-ice system. One by one, they check the tubes which carry hot air to key areas of the engine. The results are decisive. The valves inside are closed. The anti-ice system hadn't been switched on. But would this be enough to bring down Flight 90? To find out, the team carries out tests in Boeing's state-of-the-art 737 flight simulator. To their surprise, reduced thrust of 1.7 EPR is just enough to keep the aircraft flying. But then, when they factor in the problems created by ice or snow contamination, they make the breakthrough they've worked so hard to reach. January 13th, 1982. A series of factors combine to encourage snow and ice to build up on Flight 90. The aircraft is sprayed with half the recommended amount of de-icing agent. Further delays allow more snow to gather on the 737. And the use of reverse thrust may have sprayed slush onto the wings and critical thrust sensors. 23 minutes to disaster. Electrical. Wheaton and Pettit leave their engine anti-ice system off. Oh. As a result, thrust sensors in both engines freeze up, causing them to send misleadingly high readings to the cockpit. 14 minutes to disaster. The pilots notice a thick layer of snow on both wings. I mean, this one's got about a quarter to a half an inch of snow on it all the way down. But contrary to regulations, they don't turn back for more de-icing. One minute and three seconds to disaster. Pettit is confused by unusual readings on the flight deck. Look at that. That doesn't look right, does it? But his captain does not abort takeoff. 24 seconds to disaster. Flight 90 takes off with dials indicating thrust of 2.04 EPR. But because critical thrust sensors are frozen, the real thrust is only 1.7 EPR. At the same time, ice and snow clinging to the wings disrupt airflow dramatically, reducing lift. This changes the aerodynamics of the 737, causing the nose to pitch up sharply. The resulting drag reduces speed, which in turn reduces lift even further. Eight seconds to disaster. The loss of lift reaches a critical point. At an altitude of just 352 feet, the 46-ton aircraft stalls and falls out of the sky. 4.01 p.m. Flight 90 hits the 14th Street Bridge. The disaster claims 78 lives including those killed on the bridge. After his recovery, survivor Joe Stiley left his executive job to work for himself. He's overwhelmed by emotion during a rare return to the scene of the crash. I think more than anything else, I'm appreciating the 24 years I've lived since then. Like I saw my kids grow up, I held my dad's hand when he passed away. I could have missed all that.
For flight attendant Kelly Duncan, the disaster was a turning point. My prayers were answered when I heard that helicopter come. And instead of running away from God, I all of a sudden started wanting to run to God. She quit her job as a flight attendant and is now a teacher at a Baptist school in Miami. Following the disaster, aviation authorities issue a series of directives to radically improve all aircraft de-icing procedures. They include measures to make sure thrust sensors don't become blocked by ice. The changes make flying safer for every aircraft that takes off in winter. They're relocating to Florida, where Jose has found a job in the construction industry. 2.20 p.m. Captain Wheaton expects the airport to reopen soon. He orders the ground crew to de-ice the 737. Okay, guys, you can get started. It's a routine procedure to remove snow and ice from the aircraft before takeoff. But a string of further delays keeps Flight 90 at gate 12 for another hour. Clearing the runways takes longer than expected. And then there's a backlog of flights. There's nothing anyone on board can do but wait. Outside, the snowstorm continues. I could see snow accumulating on the aircraft and all around the aircraft. But it snowed the entire time we were there. When clearance to leave gate 12 is given, there's another delay. Ice on the tarmac makes it difficult to move the 737. We're too heavy for this ice. Captain Wheaton decides to help out with a blast of reverse thrust from his engines. Hey guys, I'm gonna put a little reverse on it. Are you sure? No, don't worry, it'll be okay. Three thirty-five p.m. Flight 90 eventually begins taxiing to the runway one hour and 20 minutes behind schedule. It's a relief for flight attendant Kelly Duncan. When we were finally moving away from the jetway, it was wonderful because I felt like we are finally on our way. United States, Washington, D.C., January 13th, 1982. 12.30 p.m. Joe Stiley, an executive with a large telecommunications company, arrives at Washington National Airport with his secretary, Nikki Felch. Joe and Nikki are on a business trip to Tampa, Florida. They're scheduled to depart at 2.15 p.m. on board Air Florida Flight 90. Flying is a big part of Joe's life. He's a former Navy pilot, and his job involves regular trips around the world. In those days, I was probably getting on a 737 and flying somewhere once to twice a week. It was almost a routine thing for me to be doing what I was doing that day. Outside, the weather is anything but routine. Washington, D.C. is experiencing one of the worst winters in decades. Temperatures drop to minus four degrees Celsius as a snowstorm rages. Nikki was definitely looking forward to getting where it was warm. She said, I brought my swimming suit, did you? <laughs> and I, I had not remembered to even pack one. Washington National Airport is just five kilometers south of Capitol Hill on the banks of the Potomac River. It's a major hub for flights from across the USA and Canada. On a normal day, more than 400 aircraft land here. But today, the airport is struck. A road full of potholes. Flight 90 eventually hits takeoff speed. Easy. And leaves the ground. Me too. Suddenly, the nose pitches up sharply, and the aircraft starts to shake. In the cockpit, alarms warn the pilots that Flight 90 is about to stall. Forward. They have seconds to act or the 46-ton aircraft and the 79 people on board will fall out of the sky. 
Flight 90's high nose position is creating so much drag that the aircraft is losing speed. Fast. Easy, all we need is 500. If the 737 slows down too much, it will stall and then simply drop. Captain Wheaton orders First Officer Pettit to lower the nose by pushing the control column forward. Forward, forward. But he can't drop the nose too far or the plane will stop climbing. Come on, she's barely climbing. As the shaking intensifies, former pilot Joe Stiley fears the worst. I remember vividly saying, how the hell do I get out of this airplane now? And knowing that it was too late, I was already kissing my rear end goodbye. 12 seconds after liftoff, Flight 90 has traveled one kilometer. 500 meters ahead, the heavy snow has created a traffic jam on the 14th Street Bridge over the Potomac River. Construction worker Marion Grant Jr. is on the northbound span. His truck has hardly moved for 15 minutes. Traffic wasn't moving at all. Like we'll sit still. Wheaton and Pettit go through their after-start checklist. Is the ice? Oh. APU. Running. Flight 90 then falls in behind other aircraft queuing for takeoff. Two window exits at the center of the cabin and two doors at the front. Boy, this is bad. Probably the worst snow I've ever seen. Seatbelts are released as shown. Both pilots can see snow on their wings. Pettit is concerned. You know, it's been a while since we've been de-iced. 3.59 p.m. Flight 90 is cleared for takeoff. Position and hold. Flight attendants, please take your seats. At the rear of the passenger cabin, Kelly Duncan straps herself in. Joe Stiley, Nikki Felch, and Priscilla Tirado are just a few meters away. 3.59 p.m. and 45 seconds. Tirado. The 737 finally begins to roll down the runway. Seconds later, thrust readings jump past the target level for takeoff. Now, God, look at that. That doesn't look right, does it? Pettit responds by easing the throttles a touch. Yes, it is. There's 80. But now, oh, it's taking longer than usual to reach takeoff speed of 144 knots. That's not right. And there are strange readings on the flight deck. 120. Joe Stiley is worried. We were nowhere near the normal speeds that I was used to feeling every week in a 737. Going down that runway was like riding in a back country. ...to stay open in the heavy snow. 1.38 p.m. All flights are grounded while snow plows clear the runways. The operation is expected to take an hour. At gate 12, Air Florida Flight 90, a Boeing 737, is held up by the delay. Seems like every year it gets worse and worse. Yeah, I know. I can deal with rain, but the snow is... Captain Larry Wheaton is 34. He's a family man with two children. Roger Pettit, his first officer, is just 31. He's a former US Air Force fighter pilot with an excellent record. But both men have less than three years experience flying 737s. At 2 p.m., Flight 90 begins boarding, 20 minutes late. On the two-hour flight to Tampa, the aircraft will be just over half full there are 71 adult passengers and three young children. Many are helped aboard by 22-year-old flight attendant Kelly Duncan. For her, the job is a dream come true. I loved my life as a, as a flight attendant. Whenever I went anywhere in my uniform, people would always comment about it, and it was something that I was very proud of doing and something that I really enjoyed doing. Near Joe and Nikki, are Priscilla Torado, her two-month-old son Jason, and her husband Jose.